we're talking about we're talking about while you wait for him or her. And so um, when Pastor Canaan asked me to speak on this topic, um, he was asking me to be very transparent. There's no way to actually speak about waiting in any context without actually bearing your soul. Because waiting, this is not, this is not, I'm not the person that feels compelled to have a nice rap sermon together where you have an answer at the end and you feel like, okay, cool, I can, I can run with this. God really isn't like that. What the word of God should be is a guide. The Bible says that it's a lamp unto our feet and it's a light to our path. So there is not an equation for waiting. It's not one plus one equals two. That's a misnomer. And I think we like that because we like to feel like we've given somebody something that they could run with. What we really should be giving to people is a seek so that they will take what the word of God says and they will take the preached word and then they will begin to go and seek out what God is actually speaking specifically to them. Because we don't want to, we don't want to create these robots. And that's what oftentimes happens in, in the waiting season for people is that they realize that they're actually not as deeply rooted as maybe they once thought. So I wanna talk a little bit about the don't rush challenge. Y'all, y'all remember that? Like at the start of the pandemic, the don't rush challenge. The concept was really simple and it was basically that you saw me raggedy and then you, know, you saw me all put together and, and fabulous and fantastic, but what we didn't see was what happened in the middle. Right. We didn't see that. We saw the picture, but we didn't see the process. And so the truth of the matter is, is that waiting is hard. And when we're talking about waiting for him or her, what was hard, what is hard for me is that I have the capacity and the wherewithal to go out and actually get what I want. But I step back and I allow God to orchestrate a story for me. But I actually have it within myself to go out and obtain what I'm seeking. And so it's interesting because in our humanity and in this journey of humanity, we don't actually see the totality of why God is doing what he's doing in our life. Like Moses didn't actually know he was going to be Moses while he was being Moses. Esther didn't understand the full weight of what she was doing while she was being Esther. And you or I don't fully understand how God is going to use our story and our journey to bring about glory and honor to his name. And so when we stand in that truth, what the aim then is not to come up with an equation to get what you want, but it's actually to understand the father's heart so that while you are in pursuit you can be fully engaging with him. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I, I wanna share just a little bit um, about my testimony. Pastor um, Kanan uh, graciously asked me to do so and um, bless you. And so I wanna share a little bit about that. I don't normally because, you know, the way religious people are set up, but anyway. Um, so I'm a church kid. My parents um, were ministers. I'm from Ohio, Columbus. Come on! Now that's rare. That's rare. Southside. My grandmother grew up on, on Southside, Lockbourne. Hey. <laughs> um, and so my parents um, were ministers. I was um, born in a kind of a tumultuous um, situation. I. Um, and the product of a sexual assault. And so um, the man who raised me was not my biological father. And so I dealt with a lot of issues of rejection, but not right away. I went through my childhood fairly oblivious. Um, and I'm just gonna apologize in advance for the honesty, because I know when this comes out, some of my family, but God will be glorified. I think that 
there were some issues of rejection that kind of built up over time in my life. And church really was a great substitute for community and closeness that I was not actually growing up with. Um, and so, you know, it became kind of my, not my everything, I don't want to say that, but for lack of a better term, it was really everything because I was at church all the time. And so we hear messages over and over and over again about um, sexual purity and you should wait and so forth. And I have some critiques about, you know, purity culture in general, and I may share some of those a little bit later on. But I think that, you know, when you hear those things over and over and over again and you're in that space and it felt like um, almost a contrast of thought because culturally, we were in this um, you know, revolution. I grew up primarily in the 90s and the 80s, and so um, there were you know, AIDS tests and MTV, and then the don't do it, it's horrible. And I was like, if it's horrible, why would I save it for marriage? And I'm trying to figure out, and, it, you know, and you're a kid, right? But those things are not, those messages are not clicking because in school, it's like, do it, protect yourself. And then, you know, over here, it's like, no, <laughs> don't do it. Save it for marriage. So I had a very hard time, like, conceptualizing in my mind, how do you navigate through those waters? You know, and, and so what the message was essentially, and one of the critiques that I have about purity culture is that there has been a lack of acknowledgement of simple things like hormones <laughs> and desire and need. And then it's coupled with suppression and they don't acknowledge. And then we have a generation that can't transition from someone kept to someone given. And there is, a, there, is, there is a big gap here somewhere in the middle where people are having to go out and try to figure it out without purpose. What we really should be conveying is that God's design is that purpose, partnership, protection, and pleasure, his design is that it comes through one person for you. But when I segment and compartmentalize and I tell you, you go ahead, bury the pleasure principle, find, try to find purpose, and then I'm not giving you the tools so that you actually can say, hey, this is, this is what I think God is, is doing in my life, then what I'm doing is I'm essentially I'm shackling you and I'm, I'm, I'm relegating you to bondage. But bondage is obviously easier because it helps me to control you and then you become predictable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when I was 16, um, just very kind of randomly, I just said, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until I, you know, get married. And that was great at 16 because I didn't like anybody at the time. <laughs> It was very easy to make that, that decision, you know, when, you know, nobody is in your space. And so I was really oblivious and unaware, but I do feel like the Holy Spirit prompted me to make that decision. It's just that, you know, it was also very popular at the time to make those public declarations and the attention that you got from that and, you know, and grab the ring and do the ceremony and people, you know, um, fawn over you and they're like, you look at my child, you know, she's made this wonderful decision and it was more of a reflection of my pastor and who my parents were than it actually was about what was going on in my heart. And so, you know, by the time I turned 18, I was a little shaky on the terms of the agreement. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I was like, will you really hate me if I, <laughs> you know, I was a little shaky and I was like, well, you know, if it happens, I'll just repent, right? Because I had that part down. I knew I could repent and, you know, all is well, all is well. 
And, and so then, you know, you start to understand a little bit more about the weight of and the responsibility of being with someone. And so I pulled back a little bit and I was like, well, let me just kind of get myself together and just try to figure out like how best can I navigate through these waters? And so my thing was almost to barter with God. And I said, if you, I'll wait, if you can get me to 22 and I can be married by 22, Y'all feel me? <laughs> then, you know, I, feel, I was like, I can wait because I'm in school and I'm, I'm just going to be focused. I'm going to focus on what I'm doing. And, and if you could just get me to 22. 22 came and went. I moved to Charlotte at 22 uh, for ministry. And so I was like, okay, God, you just about to set me up. I'm in full-time ministry now. And I was like, there's about to be a nice little and he's gonna be saved and full of power, and we're just gonna travel and do ministry together. 22 came, 25, and I was like, okay. (laughs) All right, Jesus, what's what's going on? I'm, I'm doing everything, I'm checking stuff off lists, right? And I'm serving you. So I felt like that was giving me some kind of brownie points for the Lord because I felt as though serving him meant that he he wanted to be glorified in me. So I felt like he was going to do something really extraordinary with my life so that he could be glorified. Use me, God. Hook me up. 25 came and... You know, there are some guys there, you know, in between or whatever. But, you know, you, I was holding out because I wanted the big fish. But I'm in, I'm in church culture, and I'm like, okay, 26, 27, 28, 30. Now, in this space, there was a guy who was on his way to being a pastor. Um, At the time, I was starting to write a book about uh, sexual purity only because, only because what I had disclosed to a pastor about my stance, he preached over the pulpit and then asked me to come up and explain to people and explain to the parents how I was waiting so that they could then train their children. And I sat there mortified because what was a personal and God-led decision had become somebody's platform. And I was devastated, but I never expressed it. And I decided to go ahead and write a book and I felt like it was going to be the one and done, and I could just explain everything and, um, and let it be done. And so in that space, what it did in the spirit realm is it made me a target. And so I started to be pursued by a young man who was on his way to being a pastor, and people said, you know, um, you guys look great together, and you could really help him in ministry. And I had some red flags. But I started to defend it because when you're desperate to be found, I had become desperate to be chosen. God, when is somebody going to choose me? That was, choosing was a, uh, had become almost a validation and an affirmation of what I felt like, you know, I, I thought, you know, I thought I was okay. So to be chosen and to lose my whole mind to pursue, and we in our 30s, and we just, we're orbiting around each other. I'm not dating anybody else. He's not dating anybody else. I'm going to his, uh, all of his engagements, and I'm there, and I'm looking the part, and, you know, got this, you know, the skirt suit on, and the heels, and, you know, he told me how, you know, he liked me to dress, and, you know, all that stuff. And, and I said to myself, I, I can do this. I can, I can play this role. I can do this. Because someone in the church said to me, when I said, I kept asking women in the church, how'd you know they were the one? How'd you know they were the one? And they 
all said the same thing, like, you just know. And I was like, that makes me nervous because I don't know. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of questions and I was searching for some sense of affirmation or confirmation rather that this was the person I was supposed to be with. And I was like, well, is there a tingle? I mean, is, <laughs> what, do I, what am I supposed to feel? that lets me know that this is the person that I'm supposed to connect with. You're just gonna know. Fam, I was like, I don't know. I really don't, I really don't know. And I was like, okay. And so then someone said to me, well, love is a choice. So you don't have to feel anything. Just make the decision. So I made it, y'all. I ain't gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry today. I made the decision. And I went through a trajectory where I was like, the Lord was giving me words for people. Canaan was one of those people. And I, you know, and what he probably didn't even realize, it's like the Lord would have me prophesy children to people. And I'm, I'm 27 at the time, 27, 28, in that 27, 30 space. The Lord would show me things about people, you know, you're going to have a child or something. And the lady would be like, oh, and I would go in my car and cry. I would boohoo. And I said, God, why are you doing this to me? I said, why are you doing this to me? I would go to weddings. I, 2017 was the last wedding and it was one of my best friends. I said, this is my last wedding because I stood up there and my legs were shaking because I could no longer kind of contain that desire. And I was like, I'm sincerely happy for you, boo. I can't do this no more. Like this is the last, don't nobody ask me to be a bridesmaid in nothing. I don't want no more godchildren. <laughs> Tapped out. And the Lord began to like stir and I had such an uncomfortability and I couldn't settle. And uh, he started a church. So I was up here, you know, in the front row and looking the part and all of that. And I said, Lord, something was happening. You know, I didn't really understand it then, but your peace can be disturbed while you're still yet playing a role. And I went to a large ministry here. Um, one that a lot of churches criticize. And I was sitting in the service and this older Caucasian woman was sitting to my right. And at this church, I had never heard anybody speak in tongues. And so she started to pray in the spirit and I felt the reverence of the Lord. I know that feeling. And I was like, Lord. <laughs> and she turned to me and she said, would you like to share something with me? I said, no, ma'am. <laughs> I said, no, ma'am. She said, yes. Yes, you have something to share. And I was like, okay, well, listen. <laughs> I was like, there's this guy that I've been, <laughs> it's a true story. I was like, there's this guy that I've been like around, you know, I haven't dated anybody else. You know, he's the only guy, but I, I like, he's not talking marriage. It's, you know, it's been like seven years. Hello. <laughs> Hello. It was seven years because I had been trained and there were conversations that I did not have the courage to have. So I was religious and numb. Wow. Ooh, Preaching, worshiping, praying, religious and numb. Pray and smile all day and then go home and curl up and cry myself to sleep. And she said, woman of God, you've gotten off track. She said, I see a pastor, but it's not the one that you with. And she said, the Lord says some things you have to let die so that what is purposeful can come to life. And I, sh I, I, I shook 
And I said, oh my God, because I knew what needed to be done. And I went another year. I went another year until the Lord began to stir on him. And he came and he talked to me. And um, in that space, I started to have some health problems. And I went to my doctor. And she said, I want to give you an ultrasound. And I said, oh, okay. I was not planning on sharing all this testimony. Praise the Lord. (laughs) I went and I had an ultrasound. And, you know, uh, if you ever had an ultrasound and the technician kind of makes small talk or whatever, she was making small talk and then she got quiet. And I was like, hmm. I was like, do you see anything? She was like, oh, the doctor will talk to you. And I said, oh, okay. And so I went back to the doctor and she said, Taya, do you um, still want to have children? I was like, yeah, absolutely. She said, well, can you have them in the next 18 months? I was like, (laughs) no. (laughs) I was like, we're not there. And I said, why? And she told me what was going on with my body. A lot of it, I think, was a manifestation of stress. And uh, she said, you're, you're going to have to make some adjustments, like, immediately. And she said, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to have children. And when I tell you I went to, I, I got out of that doctor's office as soon as I could because I was coming undone. I literally unraveled in my car. And I said, I think I'm losing my mind. I felt like I was losing my mind. I said, God, you are embarrassing me. I did what I thought you asked me to do. I checked everything off the list, and now I'm here, and one of the things that I wanted the most is without my reach, lest you intervene. And within a couple months, that young man came to me, and he said, well, I, you know, I don't think, I, I would like for us to still be friends, but I'm not always attracted to women. Religious and numb. And it started a journey for me. And I really had to get to know the Lord for real, for real. When we talk about not rushing. I want to read the scripture in Genesis chapter 24, verses 63 through 67. And I'll just read it. You don't have to turn for time. But it says, he went out in the field one evening to meditate, and he looked up and he saw camels approaching. And Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. As she got down from her camel and asked the servant, who is that man in the field coming to meet us? And he said, this is my master. So she took her veil and she covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all that he had done and Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother and he married Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Marriage was consummation, not, you know. (laughs) Waiting seems cruel because What you want is actually accessible to you. I'll just reiterate that. And so within myself, I have the capacity to fulfill myself. But I choose to allow the Lord to step into that space. Here's another truth is we often mishandle what we're not prepared for or we allow ourselves to be mishandled when we don't know what we deserve. One of the critiques that I have with purity culture is the the act of suppression. There's almost a disconnect, almost as though, you know, especially, especially it's, I think, heavier on women because women tend to belong to the community and the society and men tend to belong to themselves. It's just facts. So what a woman does seems to have a lot more weight on her community and her family and all this. So there's a whole this pressure 
to uphold. And so what is often taught is this behavior, and we keep teaching this behavior modification piece, and we're not walking in the true revelation of the beauty of the pursuit. The ache in a man and the anticipation in a woman is built within you and wired within you so that it can facilitate the connection. So if I ask you to suppress that or to disconnect from your femininity or to disconnect from your masculinity, I'm doing you a disservice because it is not the fullness of the gospel. Also, we are often taught to wait on God. When I would like to submit that we should be waiting in him. When I am waiting on you, time becomes the biggest factor. I am waiting on you to bring me something. I am waiting on you to come to me, to bring whatever has been agreed upon. When I am waiting in you, it is speaking of relationship. It is speaking of the fact that I'm going to know your heart. And we're going to be having conversations so that while the manifestation might not be here yet, I'm not blaming you because I know you, right? Like right now, like packages with the mail and stuff is like all jacked up, right? People are like not receiving packages or they're coming super, super late. And what we know about the postal service is it can be a little wishy-washy, you know? <laughs> yeah, good on most days, but it's a busy time and it's a pandemic. But one of the things that I said to someone, I was mailing them a package, is that I said, well, I said, here's the tracking number, and just keep checking. And I said, and we know it's going to get there. We know it's going to get there. But that's because of the track record that I have with the Postal Service, that I can actually say to that person, it's going to be there. Don't worry. But when I'm not actually properly rooted in the heart of God, now when, it's, when, I'm, when I'm 30, when I'm 35, <laughs> I'm like, okay. And I begin to say, what am I doing wrong? I go internal. And it becomes more about like, well, I'm checking everything off the list. The reality is it's not about a list. The purpose of waiting is preparation and timing. It's mostly timing. It's mostly timing. God, again, he wants the components to come together of, of, of pleasure, of purpose, and partnership. He wants that all to come together. So here are some things that we really need to do. And this is a part of the journey that I had to go through. Is one, I had to be honest about my desires. Like when I got real, I could say, you know, I wasn't ever really attracted to you. But I'm, because we'll do that because of the package, right? Like they've got something going on for themselves and religion says, well, you know, like y'all gonna be good together and everything like that. And, and, and I didn't want to, when I, when I came to myself, I realized, my God, I would have had to get up every morning and been like, please preach. Cause I was more in love with your anointing Please give me a word to get me going. So I had to come to a place of authenticity. And it's not that they weren't attractive. But attraction and what is attractive to you is already built within you. So don't fake the funk. Just be honest and be honest with God. I tried that whole, anyway, you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. And the man of God's eye was going in one direction. And you have to be honest. you got to be honest with the Lord about what it is you want. Then you got to be honest about your destiny. This is kind of for my ladies specifically, but I, I feel like it's for, it's, it's for everybody, obviously. But ladies in particular, we are designed to cleave. We are designed, it's within, within us to help. 
So we see when we look at when we look at people, you know, we can see, mm, I, got, I can do that, I can help you there, I can, you know, and you start to kind of think in your own mind where I can, I can help elevate you. Guys think like that too, but the problem is with women is that we will stop whatever we were doing to kind of jump on your train. Men are much better traditionally in staying focused on what they want. They may spy you from a distance, but if their desire and their goal was to say to have a house first, they peep in you, but they're still pursuing whatever they had in mind. We could be getting a whole PhD, ladies, and some guy will walk through and we like, you know, I think I'm going to sit this semester out because <laughs> I believe the Lord wants me to just be, you know, be over here with you. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because every single person in Christ, at some point in your life, you become awakened about who you really are. But if we make certain decisions prematurely, now we get into a space where you're with someone who does not have the capacity for who you really are. So it's important that they see you on a trajectory and that they can bench press the same. Or more, ladies, if you're looking, you know, for a husband, he needs to be able to bench press a little bit more than you because he got to be able to carry you and then some. Period. So it's important. So if you slow down, then what they assume is that this snail pace is your pace. And so then when you get into the whole thing of life and you just got to do life together, now you're like, no, I'm ready to go. You know, I'm a socialite. I like to get out. And they are on the couch. Now you don't have to, when, when you are, when we are, when we are broken, we tend to choose on commonalities. Sameness. We go to the same church. We under the same teaching. We got a similar anointing. We have a similar this. You know, you like this, I like this. When we are healed, we choose complementaries. Where you understand, I know what God is, where God is sending me, and I know my weaknesses, and I also have an understanding of what I need in order to accomplish. So I know what I need in partnership. As opposed to someone that's, and, and, and partnership can be abrasive, but it's progressive. So if you want progression in your life and within that relationship, you cannot always aim for sameness. But it's in the commonalities, a complementaries rather. You also have to be very clear about your assignment. We also need to be delivered from the fear of loss. The fear of loss kept me five years too long in a situation because they had become such a part of my life and my every day, and they were my friend, that I didn't understand and I could not really bear what life would have been like to not have them around. And so after that person, I went on a blind date with this guy, we met at Panera Bread, Classy. <laughs> and, and as I was sitting down, Holy Spirit said, no. <laughs> and I was like, he was like, are you okay? I was like, mm, yeah. <laughs> he was like, I ordered you a drink. Thank you. And I was just, whew. and I proceeded, I proceeded for four months. That man I got had PTSD and was paranoid, and it could have been dangerous. I was like, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. He never knew where I lived. Thank you, God. Because I, I, I mean, I had to change my number and everything. Save, sanctify, fill with the Holy Ghost, and out of order. That was me. And the Lord said, if you would just sit still and let me deal with you, 
let me deal with you. Settle in sonship. I've said this before to people, you know, why does God talk about sons and not sons and daughters, right? It is not, it's not an issue of equality, it's equity. Because as a woman, I come under, if I, when I get married, I come under my husband's name, and so I am given, I'm living under his inheritance. But in Christ and in the kingdom, we are all sons because he desires that each one of us be a partaker in the inheritance. And so because we're living here in the earth, he's got to be able to transfer and impart some things to you because we're living in hostile territory and you are called as a son to represent the family name in the earth. So he has to provide something for you. But when we settle into sonship, that means I'm looking for somebody else within my kingdom family and having a kingdom understanding. I'm not talking about churchy. I'm saying they have an understanding of the kingdom and of purpose. I have this table up here. I don't think this one was my water. I have this table up here. Okay, thank you. The difference between being hungry and not being hungry is time. That's all. Time builds desire. So as we get older on a practical level, if you desire to be married, that desire grows as you get older. You know a little bit more about life. You are more in tune with who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. But then what happened, what happened with me, what happens to a lot of us is that we don't want to wait for the meal to be prepared. We just, I got a snack. I just went and got a snack. A snack satisfies for a little while, but it doesn't have nutritional value. Imagine this table, we call this restaurant, we call this restaurant Kingdom Place. And the waiter is Holy Spirit. He's our waiter. The Bible says that he is our intercessor. So he is standing in between what I have asked God for and what's cooking back in the kitchen. God is the chef. And as I sit in this space, I'm waiting. And I'm looking around and I see other people who have ordered after me and their food is coming out. And I was like, excuse me. Holy Spirit, I ordered a husband 15 years ago. I ordered whatever, whenever. Holy Spirit says, you know, good things take time. Let me come out, let me bring you a little appetizer. And he brings us water and bread. The bread represents the word of God. The water is representative of his spirit. He said, just feast on this a while. And I am thinking, this is what happened to me. I don't know if it happens to anybody else, but I said, well, no, I don't want to feast on that because I don't want to get full. I want to enjoy my meal. <laughs> so I get frustrated and in my frustration, I leave the restaurant and I go over to fast food paradise and I grab something from there because it's quick. They whip it up, it's quick, it's cheap, it ain't cost me much. And in the meantime, now I'm hungry again. And I'm hungry again. And so now I'm looking and I'm searching and the Holy Spirit, I said, I'm going to go back to the kingdom. And the Holy Spirit comes back and says, welcome back. Thank you. I would like to order again. <laughs> with fresh revelation about what I really need and what I want. Holy Spirit says, all right, I put in my order. He brings me back more bread and more water. And I say, man of God, I, I, I just don't, just give me the food. He said, well, no, feast on this. 
But now I'm back again, and now I'm humble, right? Because I done been through some stuff. And as I'm feasting, I discover Psalm 139, 15 through 17, which says that my bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All the days, all of my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. I feast on John 15 verses three through five that says that you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. Neither can you unless you remain in me, but then you will produce much fruit. And then I feast on Ephesians chapter two verses four through seven which says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us, because of the great love he had, he made me alive with Christ, even though I was dead in trespasses, but I have been saved by grace. And he also has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens. This is the word of the Lord. Remain seated. This is the thing is, in my anxiety, I was like, no, I don't want the bread and water. I don't, I don't want to be full. But the Lord says, I want you full. Because the person that I have designed for you, designed for you, designed for you, you're going to have to give out of your overflow, not your need. So it's necessary for you to feast and to prepare and to produce from a seated position of sonship and authority. You are royal. When you are royal, you don't really worry about who you're going to marry because that person has to come through a certain lineage or have certain characteristics about them to even qualify to be with you, unless you're just going rogue. God wants you full. The meal is already prepared. But it's about God's timing. Everything is about God's timing. God knew I couldn't get married in no 2015 if he had already predestined for my child to come forth in 2021. Because I would have been pregnant in 2015. Hello. <laughs> it's timing, and it's not about you. It's about what's coming through you. So if we remain in a seated position, you may just have one place setting right now, but there's someone else that's coming to the table. And they're coming to the table with the things that they have gathered through their preparation. Because when God connects you, this is not a time to sit back. This is a time to go. That's the thing. Culture says, okay, we're going to, you know, get together and settle. That ain't kingdom. When God connects kingdom people, it's for work. So when he connects, you already have to be full because you hit the ground running in purpose. Chris, I'm about to get, wrap it up. I want to just circle back around as I'm closing here to Isaac and Rebecca. I love their story and I didn't dive into it too much because it wasn't really necessary, but I want to point this out to you. They were connected at a very critical time in both of their lives. For Isaac, the place of pain became the opening for his heart. Had his mother never died, she could not have occupied that space. He brought her into his mother's tent his mother had deceased. So the pain that he had experienced, the grief that he had experienced became the opening for transformation for him. For Rebecca, there had to be a disconnect from what she was familiar with. She had to separate from what she had known in order to transition into the space that God had for her next. I don't know why we keep trying to make this all fluffy and pretty. But the process, what it produces in you, is what God is after. P 
people will strive to get to the manifestation and not understand that the process is actually the blessing. It is the blessing. And so when God connects you from a seated place, now you can run. You're up and you can run. You are full. And he has processed you in such a way. And what that looks like is different for everybody. That's why I said this is not an equation message. This is about understanding God's heart in the wait. There are a ton of people out here. And I heard a beautiful story years ago of a woman of God. I went to Rwanda in 2018 um, as you know that whole situation was crumbling. I had always wanted to go. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'd always wanted to go. I had had Africa on my heart since I was a little girl. I would watch World Vision infomercials and I would just sob. God had given me a tender heart for Africa. And when I was with this gentleman and I would talk about Africa, he would, mm, mm, uh-uh, no. Mm -mm, no, I, that ain't my ministry. And I was like, oh, okay. But I had always had a dream that I would be able to go and serve in missions with my husband. But I said, oh, okay, no problem. And I just let that, you know, because I felt like it was more important to support him. And Holy Spirit said to me one day, I care about you too. And I was like, oh, you know how God kind of whispers something to you and you're like, okay. And I was like, oh, okay. He said, I care about you too. And I was like, okay. And I decided to step out and I went to Rwanda. And as I was there and I, when I got there, I just kind of cried and I was like, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I'm here. And it registered to me that there had been things that I was suppressing to try to fit into someone else's idea of what a wife was supposed to be. And I had lost myself. And when I came back from Rwanda, I found a counselor. I found a Christian counselor in particular because Counseling is amazing and I work with counselors a lot, but I didn't want to have to explain the nuances of church to someone. And so that was important to me because there's so many layers within the traditional black church experience that I didn't want to have to explain to somebody, okay, so this is why this person has so much power and authority, you know. And we began to deal with the layers of why I actually chose to compromise myself to make someone else happy. God is with us in what, I, what is often known as the dark night of the soul. It is that deep thing. Prior to me having a breakthrough, I sat at my kitchen table with 42 orange Motrin pills and I laid them all out and I was like, yeah, I'm done. I was like, I'm done. Because up until that point, it had been checking things off my list. Like, did this, did this, did this, did this. And marriage to me was, was something that was supposed to make me happy. And I thought it was gonna make me happy. And I thought I was gonna have somebody to rescue me from like my own internal issues and I was gonna have somebody to rescue me from dealing with crazy family dynamics and rescue me from this and pull me away from that and defend me and advocate for me. And God said, I want you to advocate for yourself and I want you to walk through this with me so that when he comes, you are full and you're not weird. <laughs> the Bible says that the trials of our faith work patience within us. Waiting is a trial because waiting can seem cruel. 
But I want to encourage those who are waiting to step into a place where you don't walk out of your authority as a son. But also, even in my brokenness, the Lord began to prompt me to pray for my husband. I would pray sometimes in tears just because I was like, I don't know why I'm doing this. Like, this is not, like, that's, this doesn't really feel warm and fuzzy. But faith oftentimes doesn't feel warm and fuzzy. And I began to pray, and, I be, and the Lord said, and now I want you to live your life every day as a wife. You're a wife and you're a husband right now. If that is your desire, you are a wife or a husband right now. It is no, there is, you're not attaining something. Who you are right now is being built and is built for someone in partnership so that you can do life together. So live even now as someone's partner and begin to stir in you, produce, bring something to the table and continue communing with God from a place of relationship, understanding that this is not about you not being good enough. This is not about you not having it together. This is not about you not being attractive. This is all about God's timing. That's all it is. It is a timing thing. And we have to stop telling people that if you do A, B, C, and D, here comes Mr. Wonderful or Mrs. Wonderful. We cannot Guarantee that unless the Lord gives you a strong word for someone specifically. We do not understand God's ways. And I believe and you just, we are, religious people don't want to live in the gray. They really want it just to be black or white. But if, but I've had to come, become comfortable with the fact that I still have questions. And that I still have a sense of God like, what in the world? And I am comfortable now with residing in that space because I know that he meets me in the suffering. He's not always relieving it. Listen, he let his only begotten son go through much pain because he understood the purpose that it was producing and the lasting purpose that it was producing. Do you not think that he would allow you to suffer a little? But that ain't the gospel because, you know, the Lord's gone. The blessing of God does not mean that you're absent from having to suffer. And if you are in a space where you are suffering, it doesn't mean you're not blessed. That's what religion teaches us, that we are serving a gimmicky God. But it's all about his purpose. The year that you were born, the year you accomplish certain goals, the year you will get married. It is all significant to his plan and his purpose for us. And when we step out of the space of like, oh, something is wrong with me, there is a confidence that comes upon you and then you begin to just move through life and you're producing and you're doing things. And before you know it, you meet somebody on your level. And honestly, like I've heard just like amazing stories. And it's been a blessing to hear how God connected people. And a lot of times people have already like known the people. Have you guys ever noticed that? Like you've crossed paths. I've heard so many stories people have crossed paths with people before like we went to church together when we were five but we didn't really know each other and then you know 20 years later God is in the details he ain't gonna miss it and I want to encourage you today you're not gonna miss it you're gonna know I'm just declaring that you're going to know who it is when they come there was something that I prayed to the Lord and I said, Lord, you know, in my time, I prayed that as I was praying for my husband and I prayed that certain things would be his characteristics. And I had to accept the fact that I had totally disregarded those for someone else. 
I want to encourage you and challenge you to pray a dangerous prayer. Pray something that only you and God would know about your future spouse so that when they come, you know. Lord, let them do this or let them be like this. And what you say in your authenticity, he will hear. And you will look up one day and someone will say something, you'll be like, Oh my God, that's them. Pray a dangerous prayer. We don't do that enough because we want to, we don't want to be disappointed. But have the courage to pray dangerous prayers concerning your future. And watch God do it. Watch him do it. Can we stand? I want to pray. Before we pray, just look at a neighbor and just say, stay seated. Father, we thank you for this time in your presence. We thank you for this time in your word. We thank you that the entrance of your word is light, that it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So Father, we thank you that this word will illuminate for us, even in this week, what our next moves should be where our focus should be. If we're in the right space, if we're off track, Lord, speak to our hearts by your spirit and let us know. But Father, also I pray that you would begin to just shower your people and reveal your heart of love to them for the desires that they hold most closely to their hearts. Father, even as they pray, concerning their future spouse, concerning their husband or their wife and their family. Father, we thank you. We call an interruption. Mm. I hear this, that a lot, of, a lot of people who are connected to this ministry are breaking generational cycles. You're doing something that a lot of people in your family have not done as it relates to either life or career or even your desire for marriage some some people in this room they don't their families don't have a good track record of marriage and so you're going to be hmm, wow so you're doing things for the first time the lord says think it not strange that there seems to be confusion around marriage for you because you don't have a template by which to go on but the lord says that in these next days and even going into the year I'm going to do a special work in the area of wisdom and strategy concerning marriage that you will not be repeating the mistakes that you have seen. Although the enemy has tried to come against because he doesn't want you to get married because he understands the cycle that you would be breaking. He understands the pattern. There's several people in here that you have even envisioned your family. You see the family that you desire or that God has shown you something to that effect. And the Lord said it is going to come to pass, but it's going to come to pass, not necessarily in the way that you think, but I am going to give you wisdom concerning how to navigate because these will be new waters for you. This will be a house of family. This will be a ministry of family. God, we thank you. And we call an interruption in the realm of the spirit for everything that the enemy has tried to bring up against the men and women of God. We call an interruption to every dysfunctional pattern, dysfunctional mindset. We call an interruption to fear and doubt and anxiety and depression in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over each and every person here today. Father, we thank you that you indeed are writing, thank you, Holy Spirit, have written their stories, that you have written their story. So, Father, we thank you for giving wisdom in this season for the pursuit of holiness and righteousness as it relates to marriage, 
Father, we thank you that they will be on the same level. We thank you that they will be able to bench press a weight together. We thank you that they will be in step together. We thank you that all the things that make them unique will be a compliment to the man and the woman of God that you have set aside for them. We thank you that the preparation has not been wasted. But Father, I thank you, God, for manifesting even more your goodness and your favor upon them. Father, even in the days to come, as they begin to express their desire again, that's what I hear the Holy, wow, I hear the Holy Spirit saying some people have stopped praying, some people have kind of lost a sense of hope, but Father, we thank you. We pray even now that as they begin to pray again, as they begin to declare again, as they step into a place of gratitude and thankfulness again, we thank you for the manifestation we thank you, God, for the manifestation of what you have spoken, even those with children. We thank you, Father, that the spouse that is coming to them will be right in line, God, with even what their child needs. Father, we thank you that they will begin to restore. We thank you for men and women who are coming to restore. We thank you for men and women who are coming to set a precedence. And Father, even though the ground may be shaky, it's only coming to shift us. It's only coming to shift us. It's only coming to shift us. And we declare that we will continue to prosper even in a pandemic, even in the limited knowledge that we have, even in God, the things that other people look at as deficiencies. You call us beautiful. You call us blessed. You call us whole in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, release a strategy to each and every person that is in this room, God. Even though they're doing things that are unique, there is a lot of unique talents that is in this ministry. God says continue to pursue those because as you are gleaning in the field, that's where you're going to meet them. They're going to be right in the space that he's called you to occupy. So the quicker you get into position, the quicker you get into the fullness of what he has for you, the quicker you step into the purpose that he has for you, they're in that field, they're in that space, they're in that environment, they're in that climate. And Father, we thank you, God. We thank you for divine providence. I declare a bullseye anointing over this ministry and over each and every person in the name of Jesus. I thank you that they will hit the mark. We declare it and we decree it that they will not miss it. We cancel out fear and the attacks of the enemy. They will not miss it. They will not miss them. They will not miss them. They will not miss them. We thank you that purpose is seeking them out in the name of Jesus. And Father, I speak a peace that passes all understanding to guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you that it is not in the doing, but it is in the being. We thank you that they shall be steadfast and unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so, Father, we thank you that it is not in what they do, but, Father, we thank you for the anointing to pursue and to pursue and to produce as you have leaded them. Father, I thank you, Father, for uh, blessing, and we thank you that you've given your angels charge over them to watch over the word. Not one drop of the word that you have spoken and declared over their life will fall to the ground for them and for their spouse. We thank you that they shall join together, and Father, do a work for you that will not be undone, that will be, although may be tried by fire, it will last, it will last, it will last, it will last, and they will be different and they will be effective. They will be different and they will be effective. Different and effective. That's the word over this house. You are different and you shall be effective. You are different and you shall be effective. And so, Father, we thank you now. We solidify it, seal it in the name of Jesus. We seal it with praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.